soothes all my doubts and dries my tears. You know, it's, that goes along with the message we're going to hear tonight. Uh, let's take our Bibles, if we would, and let's turn over to Psalm 1, verse 1. Psalm 1, 1, all right in the middle of your Bible. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for the time to be here. We thank you, Lord, that we can be together, and Lord, that we can worship you together as, as your people. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that uh, your church is the people of God. Lord, your, your children, we thankful, we're just thankful to be your children through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we, thank, we just praise you and thank you for everything you do for us. We pray for our pastor. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you'll heal him. Lord, that you'll be with him. We know that he's in prayer with, for us today. And we pray, Lord, that we can pray for him. And Lord, that we can support him in our prayers. And just pray, Lord, that you'll bless his service, Lord. Uh, and Lord, just help us, Lord, to uh, glorify your name and what we do and what we say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Psalm 1, 1, it said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth, standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Um, I wanted to speak to, tonight on, in the face of death, the hope of life. In the face of death, the hope of life. Keep your Bibles open to Psalm, and what we're going to do, we're going to do something a little different this, tonight. We're going to take our, our Bible, and we're going to read the first verse of Psalm chapter 1. 2, 3, 4, all the way up through uh, 23. So if you, if you just follow with me, we'll just be turning pages really fast, but um, it'll flow pretty, pretty evenly, you'll see. Uh, so, so Psalm 1, 1, then Psalm 2, 1, then Psalm 3, 1, then Psalm 4, 1. Let's just go through. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. O Lord, our, o Lord, our Lord how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will shew forth all thy marvelous works. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide Thy face from me. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. Give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The heavens declare the glory of God and the ferment showeth his handiwork. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I know that's a little different reading the first verse of, of uh, the chapters 1 through 23, but it kind of, if you, if you follow that, it kind of, it's kind of a roller coaster of emotion. From one chapter to another, David the writer is, and, he, and a lot of his psalms are that way. If you read that, almost read like one of the psalms that you would read. Uh, there's a roller coaster of emotion there going on that he's asking, you know, he's, he's praising God. Then he's asking a question to God. Then he's praising God. Then he's asking another question to God. Then he's saying, why is this happening? Why do, why do people imagine a vain thing? Why do the heathen rage? Why are the heathen seem to be winning in this life? Why, do, why are these things happening to me? Why is this going on? Why is this going on? Praise you, Lord, because he takes care of everything. That, the everything. You know, I ended on the 23rd Psalm. You know, 22 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Then verse, and then chapter 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How, how calming is God's still small voice when we are troubled, 
Sometimes when we pray and, and we're in distress, the only words that can come out of our mouth are our cries and our tears, which are precious to God. And in those times, that is when God hears our prayers, I think sometimes the most, and answers us speedily because he knows our distress. It's just like when your child cries when he's young or when, he, she's, when she's very young and she cries. Immediately you drop what you're doing and you run to that child and you pick that child up and you hold that child and you make sure that child is okay. God is like that because he's a loving father and he cares about us. Many times we pray and we pray and we pray and it seems like nothing is happening. It seems like nothing is being done. But when we cry, when we cry, God drops everything, and he comes, and he puts his arms around us, and he helps us. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just before the rise of Hitler in the Nazi Germany, there was a man named Dietrich, Hop Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I don't know, some of you have probably heard his name before. He was a, a pastor in Germany. Shortly before the rise of Hitler and before the rise of Nazi Germany, uh, there's this man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know, if you haven't read about him, he'd be a good person to study, a good person to get a book and read about because he was a, a, a true Christian who loved God. And he lived in a time kind of like what America is today. Uh, Germany at one time was a great Christian nation who loved God and they had great churches and they sent out missionaries and they did, they did wonderful things for God and then they kind of grew colder and they kind of grew apathetic toward the gospel and, and it, that led to the rise of the, of, uh, the Nazi Germany and, the, and Hitler and all that was going on. But he wrote a poem um, that is, I wanted to read today, um, tonight. And it's, the name of the poem is, Who Am I? You have to listen to this carefully. Um, he wrote this um, while he was in prison. Because what happened was um, Germany caught him. They put him in prison for being a pastor and for doing uh, the things that he was trying to do. And he wrote this while he was in prison. And this is it's called, Who Am I? Who am I, they often tell me, I step from my cell's confinement, calmly, cheerfully, firmly, like a squire from his country house. Who am I, they often tell me, I used to speak to my warders freely and friendly and clearly, as thought it were mine to command. Who am I, they also tell me, I bore the days of misfortune, equally smiling proudly, like one accustomed to win. And then really, that which other men tell of, or am I only what I myself know of myself, restless and longing and sick, like a bird in a cage, struggling for breath, as though hands were compressing my throat, yearning for colors, for flowers, for voices of birds, thirsting for words of kindness, for neighborliness, tossing in expectations of great events, powerlessly trembling for friends at an infinite distance, Weary and empty at praying and thinking at making, faint and ready to say farewell to, to it all. Who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once, an hypocrite before others, and before myself a contemptible will be gone, weakling, or in, is something within me still like a beaten army, fleeing in dis disorder from victory already achieved? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine. Whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. So it's a man who was in prison, who had been put in prison. He was faithfully serving God, and he was a pastor in Nazi Germany. As you can imagine, he had a chance to flee. He came to America for a while and was free and, and decided that his fight was with his people. And he had no uh, business trying to go back and rebuild Germany after the war if he didn't fight with Germany. Uh, on the side of right against Hitler while he was there. And while he was there, he was in prison, and he wrote this, this poem, Who Am I? And, uh, you know, it kind of reminds me, you know, this is a roller coaster of emotion, just like what we read with David, how David many times would ask many questions. And God doesn't mind questions at all. God has all the answers, so he does not mind any question that you can throw at him. But a lot of times uh, when we're in uh, these certain places in our life, there's questions that arise, and doubts can arise, and fears can arise, and, and God is okay with us throwing that at him because he has the answer. And, and I like how the poem ends. It says, whoever I am, thou knowest, O God, I am thine. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew that no matter what, he was God's and God's, God was his. Uh, it kind of reminds me, you know, um, in Matthew 11, if you want to go there, Matthew 11, 2 and 3. We'll go there quickly. <clears throat> it kind of reminds me of another person who was a great man of faith, who had, who had some doubts and some, some 
uh, questions. Matthew 11, 2 and 3. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Uh, out of all the people who were born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a man of faith from his youth up. John the Baptist went out into the desert to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to repent, to be baptized, and to repent of your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist was a great man of faith. Yet John the Baptist, when he was in prison, when he was all alone, when nobody was around him, had questions, and he had doubts, and he had fears. And he said, he said, to his disciples, he said, Go to Jesus, this one whom I baptized, this one who I said, Behold the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. Go to him and ask him this question, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? In this poem, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer kind of remind me of John the Baptist. You know, they were both in prison. They both had time alone where the devil was there to attack them. Because when you're alone, that's when the devil wants to kick you. That's when the devil wants to drag you down even further than you are. When you're all alone, when, you're, when you feel like everything's going against you, when you think that there's nothing going your way, the devil is there to kick you right then, and he's there to put that little seed of doubt in your mind. And that seed of doubt, he wants it to grow and grow and grow. But there's Jesus that, that you know, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Jesus is there to build faith. God's word, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, God the Father, will always build faith in your life. He's not there for doubt. He's there to erase doubt and to build faith. Faith is confidence. And that is what a Christian needs to have is confidence. Even in our worst and lowest time, it's okay to ask questions. And when we ask questions, the Holy Spirit's going to be there with that still small voice saying, it's okay. It's okay. I'm here for you. And everything that you believe is true. Corey Ten Boom said, you know, I'm talking about going through your lowest times. And I know that John the Baptist, when he was in prison, he, he was going through a lonely time. He was going through a hard time. And if, if he could look forward in his life, he was about to have his head chopped off. Because what did he do? He preached righteousness. He preached the right thing. He said the the, he said that sin was sin in a world that didn't want to hear about sin. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was trying to do what was right in a world where everything had gone crazy. Hitler was trying to conquer the world, and he lived in his land. And, of course, Hitler did not want to hear what Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to say. Cory ten Boom said about bad times. She said, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away your ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. You see what she said? I want to read that again because she's a very wise woman, and, and I, I love her illustration. She said, when a train goes through a tunnel and it gets dark, you don't throw away your ticket and jump off. You sit still and trust the engineer. You see, and that's what, that's what Jesus was telling John. That's what Jesus was telling Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This, this life is not our best life now, and that's what we hear from, from pro prosperity preacher, preachers today. They're, they want to tell you, listen, you can, you can come to Christ and live your best life now. You can have the nice car. You can have the nice house. You can have everything you want in this life because God wants what's best for you. And there's a lot of truth to that God does want what's best for us. But what's best for us may not be what we think is best for us. God wants us to have an eternal home in the heavens. He wants us to have things that are incorruptible, not corruptible. You see, the things of this world are all going to pass away. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust that we have, all these things. You know, if you, if you put your faith in a car, it's going to rust. If you put your faith in a house, it's going to fall down. If you put your faith in your family, your family may, may let you down. There are so many things in this life that will let you down. God wants what's best for your life, and what's best for your life is eternity. The things that are not going to fall apart, the things that are not going to rust, they're not going to decay. There's a home in heaven waiting for us, and at the end of our life, if we have been faithful to God and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we don't want to, you know, when times get tough, we don't want to tear up the ticket and jump off the train. That doesn't get things better for us. We want to sit tight and trust the engineer. There are those who try to be the engineer of their own life. God has allowed them to control their own life, 
but that control will end in death. Elizabeth I, I'm always intrigued by people's last words on earth. When they're on their deathbed, what do they say? Elizabeth I, she said, all my possessions for one moment of time. She said, all of my possessions for one moment of time. She was saying, I would give everything I had. Very rich woman. She was the, qu she was the queen. You know, she was Elizabeth I. She was the queen. She said, all of my possessions for one moment of time. She could trade all of her possessions. It wouldn't gain her one more moment of time. Yet she was going on her deathbed, she says this, as she's going out into eternity. Now, she was going to have all the moments in time that there are because there is an eternity out there. There's, there's, a, there's a span that we can't understand in this life. All we can understand in this life is we're born and we live and we're going to die. But outside of that, there's no time. As far as you can look either direction, there's no time. God has always been. He's always going to be. We had a beginning, but we never have an end. That end is going to, that, 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 that beginning of our, of our eternal existence ends at our death, whether it's for all of eternity in heaven or all eternity in damnation in hell. And that is, what, that is what Elizabeth I was trying to do. She was saying, listen, she was saying, listen, I would trade everything that I own for one more moment in this time. Um, you see, the train, she tried to be the engineer of her own train. She tried to be the, the engineer of the, her own train. And the problem is she controlled that train because God gave her free will, and she controlled that train right up to the end until she died. And then she was out of control, and that train went off the track, and she went out into an eternity lost without God as far as we know. Uh, Cardinal, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce his name, so I'll just, I'll just spell it. It's B-O-R-G-I-A, said on his deathbed, I have provided in the course of my life for everything except death, and now, alas, I am to die unprepared. How sad are those last words? Those two people, how sad are those two last words? You know, he said, I have provided in the course of my life for everything except death, and now, alas, I am to die unprepared. I know people who save up for retirement. And I think that's very wise. I think it's very wise. You know, the Bible says, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Because the, the ant stores up for future time. And, the, and one of the wisest things you can do is store up for the future. But the Bible is talking about eternity. Now, it's good for us to provide for our retirement. It's good for us to provide for our future and for our children's future here on this earth. But to provide for our children and our future on earth without preparing for eternity is foolishness. And it will not, it'll lead to nothing because that will all pass away. You see, we need to make sure that we have Jesus Christ as our engineer for our train. We need to make sure that if there's anyone here tonight that does not know for sure that Jesus Christ is the engineer of the train that you're on. In other words, he's Lord of your life. He's king of your life. And when he says to do something, you do it. When he says not to do something, you don't do it. Because he has to be Lord to be your Savior. He died on the cross for your sins, for my sins, that we might have eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, we're all sinners. We are all unable to provide for our own salvation. The Ten Commandments, the Bible says the Ten Commandments is perfect converting the soul. As far as it is a perfect way to show people that they're lost. Because nobody can live up to those Ten Commandments. Nobody. Nobody that's ever lived has ever lived up to those Ten Commandments except for Jesus Christ. And that's why he's the only way, he's the only life, and he's the only truth. Spurgeon, I want to flip this over from, from those who didn't believe their last dying breath, what they said, to, to someone who, who was a true Christian. Um, Spurgeon was a great preacher. Uh, he was called the Prince of Preachers. He was a great man of God. And on his deathbed, here's what he said. He was a great theologian. He said to a friend on his deathbed, My theology now is found in four little words. You know, this great man who talked about theology all the time, and he was a great, you know, if you ever read his books or you read any of his quotes, they're amazing because he was, a, he was, a, he was in the Word of God. He loved the Word of God, and he could just show you things so clearly. I just love reading some of his stuff because it's so clear how, how simple he makes the gospel that anyone can understand. But he said, All of my theology is found in four little words. Jesus died for me. That's pretty profound. It doesn't get any better than that. And that's what all of us have to come to realize, is that Jesus died for me. He says, I would not say that this is all I would preach if I were to be raised up again, but it is more than enough for me to die upon. He's saying, you know what? Jesus was good enough to live by, and he's good enough to die by. 
There's no other thing that you can come to the end of your life. You know, what, what is your final words going to be? What's going to be on your tombstone? What are, what are the final words to your family going to be? What are you going to say at the end of your life? You know, we've read a couple quotes here of different people, uh, what they said at the end of their life. This is a very short sermon, very short message. Uh, Jesus is life. Jesus cares about you in your darkest time. And ultimately, if we're unsaved, that's the time that we need him the most. And all we have to do to be saved is call upon the name of the Lord. Believe that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and he will save us from our sins, and, and he'll show us a better way to live. Only days before the end of the war, as we go back to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, only days before the end of the war, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was in prison, and the, the orders came down to execute Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They took him out to execute him, and his final words, his final words were, this is the end for me. No, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. This is the end. For me, the beginning of life. They were about ready to execute him, and that's what he said. Because he understood, this is the end, but for me it's the beginning of life. All of eternity. Let's end with Romans 8, 31 through 39. If you'll turn to Romans 8, 31 through 39, we'll end with this. Because this sums up these great Christian men who trusted God to their dying breath because they understood that uh, when times got dark, you don't throw away the ticket and jump off the train. What you do is you trust the engineer to get you to the final destination. Romans 8, 31 through 39 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, it is that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your comfort. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit of comfort, Lord, who is called the Comforter. We just thank you, Lord, that if we go through dark times, Lord, that you're there with us. We thank you, Lord, that no matter what we face, Lord, you're there with us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, when we go through the dark tunnels of life, Lord, that you're there. And we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, that we will trust you to our dying breath. And, Lord, that our last words will be that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world. And, Lord, that you bled and died on the cross, Lord, that we might be saved. And that, Lord, our hope is in thee, and our hope is in salvation and in heaven, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you'll be with us. Uh, invitation, Lord, if there's anyone here who's not sure of their salvation, Lord, help them, Lord, to make their calling and election sure. And Lord, just bless our pastor, Lord, with healing and bless this church. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Stuart, would you come with a song of invitation?